Gabor Mate is a world-famous expert on addiction. In his book, In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts, he talks about how addiction is best viewed not as a crime or an illness, but as a coping mechanism for a personal, spiritual crisis. Addiction is a response to human suffering. It's an attempt of a human being to feel actually normal. And so rather than a disease or a choice, it really is a coping mechanism. Social media, there's been a lot in the press around our addiction to social media. So um, what do you feel drives that, or our unhealthy relationship with it? Is it the same dynamics? Is there more to it? Well, uh, you can use social media responsibly just as you can exercise responsibly. Or you can exercise addictively. Or you can use social media addictively. So it's their internal relationship to them, these activities that defines whether they're addictive or not. Now, if you're using something for temporary relief or pain, pain relief or, or pleasure, and you crave it despite negative consequences, you've got an addiction. Whereas if you're using social media not to escape emotional distress, not because you're craving it, but simply because it's a useful modality, and you don't suffer negative consequences, then it's not an addiction. So it's not the external behavior. Uh, I mean, you can drink alcohol, not addictively. You can have sex, not addictively. You can go shopping, not addictively. Or you can engage in all those activities in a purely compulsive, addictive fashion, depending what the internal dynamic is. Does it provide temporary pleasure? pain relief, do you crave it, and do you continue with it despite negative consequences? That's what tells you whether it's an addiction or not. Now, broadly speaking, social media are highly addictive, and a lot of people are addicted, and it having a devastating effect on their lives. But not, but not of course, everybody. Especially on social media, but just in general, we, the, this polarization seems to be increasingly ideological. You mentioned people are really in their specific tribes and speaking from, you know, let's have a chance to hate the other tribe. Yeah. C can we be addicted to ideology? Well, again, if you define addiction as I do, as any behavior that a person craves, finds temporary pleasure or relief in, suffers negative consequences, and cannot give up despite negative consequences, that's an addiction. Again, I don't care whether it's sex, gambling, ideology, or cocaine. And, and the brain circuits are the same. The, the same brain circuits are involved in all the addictions. So we think there's all these different addictions. If you actually look at the addicted brain, it's the same brain circuit that's involved in all addictions. So uh, an ideology that um, allows you um, free expression of your impulses, you will get to hit somebody if, you, if you're angry. You get to throw a, a window, through, a, a rock through somebody's window, or a verbal bomb to their personal sense of self. Um, if, it, if you're lacking a sense of personal power, but the ideology gives you a pseudo-empowerment, now you belong to something really important. If there's no meaning in your life, and the ideology gives you a pseudo-meaning, uh, if uh, you're lacking genuine pleasure in your life, and you get the pseudo-pleasure of connecting with people who see things the same way, an ideology can function like an addiction. And furthermore, it invites denial, just like addiction always invites denial. When I was in my addictive behavior, which I have been, I was in total denial that I was an addict. To me, it was just a natural thing to do. It doesn't matter what the cost was to the people around me. Ideologies can do the same thing. You're in total denial about the impact on yourself or on others. So yeah, ideology can function like an addiction. And you mentioned the, the word meaning, which yeah. really um, is, is a word that's come up a lot with a lot of our guests. And you know, there's, this, there's this sense that what we're seeing now with the increased polarization, the, the chaos in world politics, is driven in large part by a spiritual void, a loss of connection and meaning. I, I remember in the book as well, you mentioned that's an aspect of um, uh, drug addiction as well. Um, would you agree with that, um, General? sense that we are facing a global maybe void in meaning? Well, um, there's an American psychologist uh, who had that human beings are all creatures with special needs. And I think one of our special needs is for meaning. Our lives are not meant to be just lived for the daily sake of 
physical existence. Now, that meaning in a tribal setting is automatically provided for you because you're bigger than yourself and you belong to something greater than yourself. And when you're connected with nature, or you're connected with uh, some spiritual practice or, or belief, you have some meaning that, that, that transcends your daily struggles for survival. Now this society has pretty much reduced that. Like we, we talk about meaning a lot and we talk about broad values such as freedom and democracy and so on, but that's not what people experience in their daily lives. Nobody experiences democracy in their daily lives. Mostly people work in institutions where they're told what to do and they have no voice in the matter whatsoever. And the freedom is very often reduced to making choices between meaningless uh, alternatives. So there's a deep, and, and there's more and more disconnection, as we've already mentioned. So there's a, there's a deep lack of meaning in people's lives. The addictions can certainly come along and provide a, a false, temporary, but momentarily satisfactory sense of meaning. And um, meaning is, is, is important to all of us. We all want to feel there's something more significant about our lives than simply the fact that uh, we have dinner in the evening and we defecate in the morning. On that point around this devastating effect, um, we've talked a lot on the channel and some of our guests have talked about the, what feels like an increasingly polarized world. You know, the people are, are very in, entrenched in camps, particularly on social media. Um, and, you know, we've also talked around uh, how we get trapped in kind of fight or flight. Uh, and social media seems like a very reactive space. We seem to behave differently on there. So I was curious, can, you, can your work also help us kind of get, get an understanding of that, a broader understanding of how we behave on social media? Well, first of all, <clears throat> what's the case in this society is that people are less and less connected. Uh, human beings were not meant to live in these, uh, from the evolutionary point of view, we're not designed to live in these complex, uh, vast um, aggregations. We were meant to live in small hunter-gatherer band, hunter bands where everybody knows everybody else and there's deep connection between people. And that's how we've lived for the most part for millions of years, hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands of years of evolution until really quite recently. So there's a lot of disconnect in this society. People literally don't know their neighbors. Neighborhoods are no longer neighborhoods. They're isolated uh, domiciles for the most part which means there's a deep hunger for connection and the social media provides a simulacrum of connection, the, 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 the pretense of connection. And so what do people have on social media? They have friends. They like each other. These are attachment dynamics. These are connection dynamics. But the friends aren't real friends because real friends know you and you're not afraid to show them who you are. On social media, people have concocted an artificially adorned persona and it's these artificial entities that then people like. So the individual never gets the sense of being really liked because they know that it's just their image that's being liked. And, and the so-called friends are not there for you when you need them. And yet you use the same language. Liking and friends are very strong language. But social media is a pale uh, copy of them. So the less it meets your real needs, the more addictive it is because the more and more what you need to get. Number one. Number two, um, I'm not sure that it's caused, but it certainly revealed the many subcultures in this society and allows people who belong to various ideological uh, groupings to identify one another and to band together and to have sort of a pseudo camaraderie. So we can all hate the same thing. We can all be hostile to the same people. Um, and anybody can express an opinion. Um, in the old days of the news letters to the newspapers, people had to be pretty responsible for what they wrote. They had to identify themselves. Social media, you can say anything you want about anybody. doesn't matter how hurtful, how wrong, how um, hateful, really, and not even identify yourself. So it allows people who otherwise are on the margins of society to aggregate in these pseudo groups that then promote one another's most negative tendencies. And there's no gu guidance there, there's no leadership, there's nobody to call you to your senses, there's nobody to say, really, do you really mean that? Is that what you really intend? 
what's really going on. So there's peer groupings without any kind of guidance. It's really like a, a teenage gang phenomenon where people band together, mostly for negative reasons. They're lacking contact, so they need to band together, so that's legitimate. But they, they, get, they band together without mentorship, without tradition, without uh, adult guidance. And, and so we see what we see. Yeah, and so is, is your feeling that in those groups, especially if, if there's a lot of hateful rhetoric in it, um, what would be your kind of immediate sense of what a way through that would be or a way to reach those people? Well, I don't know that there's a way to reach those people, uh, except through personal contact. Uh, I, I think that um, uh, if, if you take the analogy of the teenage gang, uh, only if somebody comes along who can provide genuine guidance that these people will trust. But with the social media groups, who knows where they live? Who, who knows how to contact them individually? Who knows how to speak? to them in a way that's compassionate and uh, enrolling at the same time. That'll open up a different parts of themselves. So, but I don't know that the social media causes all that or simply reinforces it mm -hmm. or maybe makes it more manifest. I think you've always had these groupings. They just haven't found a way to, at least you've always had such people, they just haven't found a way to reinforce and validate each other quite to the same degree as you have it now. Yeah. I was very interested um, reading in the book, uh, you used an example of there's an area of the brain I called the OFC. Yeah. And that's kind of, um, it mediates uh, in part, uh, it picks up on physical emotional cues and yeah. that's a big part of why, how we trust each other. Right. And I, as I was reading it, I was thinking, well, that's something we certainly can't do online and, and can only happen face to face. And so, yeah, it sounds like to have these authentic conversations, we need to be in contact. Well, you see, the, you, as you and I are speaking to each other early, uh, uh, we're tracking each other's face. And, and our ear muscles are actually adjusting themselves automatically to hear not just what's being said, but also the tone of voice in which being said. And you will nod when I say something, or I might nod or smile when you say something. So communication is as much about these nonverbal cues, which are mediated through our nervous, nervous system, as it is about the verbal content. Now, none of that exists on social media. It's not genuine communication. Human communication is almost meant to be face-to-face. -face. And even if I were to write a letter to somebody that I was going to mail, that's a much more conscious and um, deliberate process than dashing something up on social media and pushing the send button in a state of tizzy, you know, so that it's much less impulsive. So social media really takes away the, the nuts and bolts of human communication and provides only the surface manifestation of it. So what masquerades as communication is really uh, diatribes very often. And I know what it's like because I get an email and which might trigger me and then right away I want to write it out and then push the send button. And boy, have I had to learn not to do that because uh, there's no reflection there. It's just whatever emotion arises, you express it and then you communicate it right away without any reflection. If I'm talking to somebody, as long as we're connected, by and large I'm going to reflect on what I say before I say it. By and large I'm going to be modulated by the fact that I'm talking to a real human being. And uh, as I point in my book, the, what the addicts lack very often is emotional self-regulation. They, 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 uh, the, the parts of the brain that regulate our emotions, including the orbital frontal cortex, just don't develop in addicted people because the conditions for development aren't adequate. So the brain does develop in interaction with the environment. So now you have a lot of people with brains that are not fully developed. They might be intellectually developed, but the emotional circuits aren't. So now you have a lot of people with emotional underdevelopment communicating impulsively on social media. And that's what we're seeing. And so people will say horrible things on social media. They might, not, they might never even say in real person to anybody. A lot of the understanding that's in the book has come from working with, with people in states of distress, working with individuals. How do you see that as um, being applied more widely to society? Do you think that we have a crisis with 
with the same issues that people are struggling with individually in society? And if so, how do we deal with that? Well, uh, in, in the book, in the realm of hundred wars, I point out that addiction is rooted in trauma. Now, then I look at society as a whole. And um, if society, like, let's look at British society or, or American society, were to be seen as an individual, how would we see these individuals as behaving? When I look at the, um, the two individuals that ran for the presidency of the U.S., they're both deeply traumatized people. One of them so much as says that the world is a horrible place. Those are his words. Uh, that sense of the world's horror arose from his very dysfunctional childhood where he was demeaned and attacked and uh, humiliated by his father. One of his brothers drank himself to death. A really traumatized person and that trauma shows up in his impulsivity, his lack of attention, in his emotional shutdown, in his excessivity, in his paranoia. The person who ran against him was an emotionally shut down person who learned from her mother very early that she mustn't be vulnerable. They literally told a story about that during the convention, how the mother basically tells her, you mustn't be afraid, you mustn't be, be vulnerable. This person then has pneumonia without even telling the world about it during the election campaign. This person puts up with the philanderings of a highly uh, uh, amoral husband and protects it. Uh, that's a sign of emotional shutdown and trauma. So you had two traumatized individuals running for the presidency of the most popular, I should say, the most powerful nation on earth. That means it's a traumatized society. They had a choice between two kinds of traumas. Are we getting further and further into that realm of hungry ghosts? Well, the hungry ghost is a Buddhist image uh, where there are several realms. There's the animal realm of our rage and our appetites and our lusts the human realm with the ordinary selves, the hell realm with, um, actually the animal realm is actually our, 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 our drives and our lusts. The, the human realm is ordinary selves. The hell realm is the unbearable emotions of hatred and rage and loathing and terror and so on. Then there's a couple of other realms. Now, the hungry ghost realm, the creatures are depicted as ones with large, empty bellies, insatiable gu gu guts, small, narrow gullets, and small mouths, so they can never get enough from the outside, always trying to feed themselves. In other words, they're always buying the products of this consumer society, always trying to fill themselves with more fame, more food, more fantasy, uh, more goods. And my contention is, is that we dwell, so many of us in the hungry ghost realm, as our attempt to escape the hell realm. There's emotions in us we can't stand. We try and stuff them down with consumer goods, with drugs, with behaviors, with um, social attainment, with social approval, uh, with meaning and activities. So yes, this is a society of hungry ghosts where people are by and large alone, they haunt their lives without being fully engaged, and they're insatiable. And that insatiability then finds its cultural expression on television. You have a food channel now. It's just all about eating. Uh, nothing wrong with eating, but this, but this um, cultural obsession, what is that a substitute for? And you talked before about the, the realm of the hungry ghosts, and that's a, a Buddhist metaphor. Do you find the Jungian framework to be useful, the idea of the shadow and integration of the shadow in this work? Well, we all have our shadow side, uh, which has to be integrated. I mean, there's a part of me that's full of rage and hatred and jealousy and envy and, and, and sometimes homicidal fantasies. That's just a part of me. Nothing wrong with that, uh, as long as I'm aware that they're in me and they're not me. My problem with Jungianism, however, is that it ascribes these qualities to the shadow side, to something about an archetypical thing. They don't talk about trauma very much. Whereas I think, and this is what I point out in my book, In the Realm of Hunger Ghost, is that these dark impulses in people and the need to escape from them actually arise out of genuine human experience. They're not simply part of human nature. They're really outcomes of trauma.
and that trauma is experienced in childhood. And in my view, unless you deal with the trauma, you're not really dealing with the shadow side. It's one thing to acknowledge that the shadow side is there, but if you look at the, unless you look at the traumatic basis of it, so I do think that Freudianism and, and even Jungianism, Jung is much more sophisticated, I think, than Freud is, and has much more meaningful things to say about human functioning for all the great insights that they both had, and I learned a lot from both. But they both ignore trauma. And I think that trauma is the missing piece in modern psychology and modern education, modern medicine. And so I think that without looking at trauma, speaking of the shadow side, remains somewhat shallow. Interesting. And you're, you're from Canada. Yeah. One of the, the, the biggest um, phenomenon of the last couple of years has been Jordan Peterson. Yeah. What have you made of, of him, his rise, and what it says about the culture that people are so thirsting for what he's talking about? Peterson, first of all, is very bright, extraordinarily articulate, and in some ways a compelling speaker. So he's an, he's an attractive figure in some ways. When I read him, I sense a lot of suppressed rage in him. I, I, in fact, I think his voice is choking with rage a lot of the time. It's interesting because he talks about rage, that you have to deal with it. I don't think he understands just how angry he is. And, it's, and, and, and if you look at his websites, the comments are full of rage by his young acolytes. Now that's an energetic thing. That, that it's his energy that draws people as much as what he actually teaches. Secondly, he teaches repression. I mean, he, he very rightly takes an issue where somebody mandates a certain kind of language, and he very rightly and righteously says that I will not be dictated to about what language I'm going to use. Well, good for him. I'm all in favor of not mandating language on the one hand. On the other hand, he basically advocates repression. Uh, in his book, he talks about how an angry two-year-old child needs to be sit by themselves until they get over it. Rather than understanding why a child would be angry at age two, what frustrations they're having, and what human contact they need to help them move through that anger, he says repress the anger. So he's all about repressed anger as far as I'm concerned. And it's very interesting how he talks about children. He talks about little varmints and little monsters and so on. I know that's meant to be humorous, but it's also a certain way of thinking of the young human child. So fundamentally, I see him as an agent of repression. He posing as an agent of libertarianism. Not to mention, he's got this being in his bonnet about what he considers to be, seems to consider to be conspiracies by left-wing intellectuals. They seem to be his bet noir. Uh, being a left-wing intellectual myself, I like to talk to him sometimes. What are you so upset about, Jordan? What are you so afraid of? You know, he talks about these bloody Marxists. And, 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 he, and he points out very accurately all the horror that occurred under so-called Marxist regimes particularly in the Soviet Union. He's absolutely accurate about that. But then he promotes Christianity. Shall I tell him about the mass murders that occurred in the name of Christianity? Shall I tell him about all the millions that were slaughtered in the names of the gentle Jesus? In other words, let's be fair about it. Uh, he seems to pick ideologies to attack and abhor and embrace other ideologies that are just as murderous in practice sometimes. It's a much more interesting question for me. What happened in Eastern Europe? How come under an ideology that was meant to be liberate people, so many people were oppressed? I come from Eastern Europe. I was born in Hungary. He doesn't have to tell me about what it was like. But how about asking, how come uh, a religious philosophy that was meant to promote love and acceptance and compassion has become such an agent of two millennia of repression, oppression, and, 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 and killing. So can we be objective, or are we going to be simply tribal about it? I have a lot to say to Jordan, or a lot to, as much as I appreciate, actually, some of what he says. And as interesting as I find him, I think he's a very mixed figure, largely an agent of, of repression.